Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, hello. I hope you guys grab a snack and something to drink because with me today is Sherry Yarborough from Praxis Senior Care Caregiving Solutions, almost screwed it up. And we are talking today about diverse eating is healthy eating. So welcome back, Sherry. Well, thank you for having me again. I appreciate You're welcome. it. This is a great topic because I do have quote unquote experts, doctors, etc., that you know, want to tell us all the things we should and shouldn't be eating and doing and all that great stuff. But you're not one of those experts. You're expert in something else, which is great, but you're not a nutritionist. You're just a normal human being that wants to talk about healthy eating. Absolutely. And healthy eating, healthy eating is one of those terms that we've all heard. So it's assumed that we all know what it means. But when you step back and really take a look at it, there's no real consensus about what healthy eating means. That is for sure. It, it's, it's really, it, healthy eating operates in this space of um, eat this, not that. And that can be very confusing and overwhelming, particularly for people who are caring for someone and you're trying to make sure that this person eats well. I read an article about five years ago, and it was truly confusing, <laughs> that said um, that diverse eating may not be healthy eating. So of course, exactly. So I was like, what? Wait, what? And so when I read the article, when I filtered through all of the um, academic $10 words, <laughs> It came down to people who have diverse eatings, eat, who eat diversely, often eat a wide range of food that include foods that may not be as healthy. So I, when I looked at their definition, which please don't ask me to repeat because I don't remember what it was, but <laughs> I thought to myself, well, okay, that's one way to define diverse eating. I personally wouldn't do it that way, but it's their study, so they can call it what they want. And I, and I kept thinking, you know, if this is confusing to me, and I know how to read this stuff, what about ordinary citizens who suddenly hear diverse eating may not be healthy? And what it boiled down to was people who eat a wide range of foods sometimes don't pay as close attention to the quality of food that they're eating. And I said, okay, all right. Well, you know, this whole healthy eating thing of eat this, not that exists in, in our space of food where convenient packaged food is a lot more accessible than the quote healthy food. It's, it's ironic that in this space, giant bags of fried corn chips are more, are more budget friendly than fresh ears of corn. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I get um, groceries delivered. So we're like, we have one grocery store about a mile-ish away. And they have 90% of what we normally eat. So that means we have to go to the Safeway, which either direction is at least 20 minutes away. Or I have to like give up the quote healthier options. And so I've gotten very good at managing the ordering system. It's, took a few tries. I've gotten other people's food. And once I didn't get my mixture of berries so i every week buy strawberries raspberries blueberries and blackberries and mix them together for my breakfasts and two pounds of strawberries and the small little i think they're eight ounce containers of the other three berries 45 bucks exactly and i was like dang man <laughs> like i know these are good for my brain but holy toledo 
you know, and apples are like two, three dollars a pound and they make them huge. So one apple is almost a whole pound. It's like, he gets, you know, and I, I ignore all the processed packaged foods because a dozen years ago, I went on a weight loss journey and learned that even though I ate pretty well, it still wasn't right for my body. And then brain health and avoiding the diabetes, it's on my dad's side of the family. It's just like eating as well as I possibly can is very important to me. But dang, our food bill is ridiculous. Exactly. <sighs> and so this whole healthy eating thing exists in that space where the, quote, healthier things are not as budget friendly and accessible as the not so good, not so healthy options. And I thought to myself, okay, that's confusing. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to care for someone, that can suddenly start getting overwhelming. So when I think about healthy eating, I said, okay, what do I mean? Never mind what. And have you seen the my plate on the myplate.gov, which revised the <laughs> which revised the um, food pyramid? I think I've glanced at it like once or twice. What What's the big change? Well, it's interesting because it, it, it encourages people to put one quarter of their plate in fruits, one quarter in vegetables, one, qu one quarter in meat, and then the rest in grains. And I thought, okay, that sounds all right. But what exactly does that mean? And then you, when you really go in and start looking at all these different food pyramids and everybody's trying to adjust it to make it better, it's like, okay, this can suddenly start get overwhelming. This could get overwhelming for a caregiver. Mm -hmm. What do I feed this person? So I, as I was looking in this space of it, I said, you know what, let me make my own de definition <laughs> of what healthy eating means. And for me, healthy eating means three things. Number one, consuming the foods that help your body function optimally. That's number one. Number two, look to, look to other cultures for flavor profiles and cooking techniques that can help support your body in, in optimizing food consumption. And the third and most important thing, have fun. Yeah. <laughs> because, and I'll spend a little more time talking about this, but we all know that if we have a food restriction and it isn't um, fun and we can't enjoy our food, you're not going to do it for very long. Nope. Not at all. I have a, a point to your, to, your, to your first point is eat what fuels your body the best. Mm -hmm. Um, when, so I went on this huge weight loss journey and worked with a personal trainer and she helped dial in an eating plan that worked for my body, which was extremely low fat, but it included a modest amount of starchy carbs. I misunderstood part of what she said, and I managed to lose a hundred pounds eating more starchy carbs. Now. Most of my starchy carbs are either um, whole wheat or some sort of blend. Um, I don't eat white bread stuff. It's not even tasty. Um, sourdough is about as well. No, my sourdough is even cracked wheat. So it's all more whole grain. And I have learned through experience that if I do not have some sort of starchy carb with most meals, I will be hungrier, faster, sooner, and I will not have the same kind of energy. So I used to do a 20 mile bike ride every Thursday night with my old, my previous cycle group and, you know, lost all this weight, wanted to make sure I kept it off. So I just had uh, protein and veggies before this ride and 10 miles in my energy just went <laughs> right down the tubes. And I thought this is ridiculous. I do this every week. This is like, this is like a no brainer. You know, it's like, was not generally um an exertion i mean it was exerting but it wasn't challenging so it was like this i'm not doing that again <laughs> and well, i know people who if they eat starchy carbs 
they outgrow their pants in a week. <laughs> Since everybody's so different, you have to learn what works for you and what you can do for the rest of your life. You know, and there's this whole concept of superfoods. And I was just in the grocery store today, and there was a big article about avocados and how wonderful avocados are. I love avocados. I do not like avocados. <laughs> I love avocados, but they do not like me at all. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> oh, no, they hate me. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, let's look at what's in an avocado. What can I find that has similar nutrient density as an avocado to, to make my body feel good? And I, I was thinking um, my, my godmother was a little frustrated recently well, over the last couple of years because she developed GERD and she's always loved tomatoes. Yep. And, and tomatoes are at the top of the no-no list for GERD. I'm familiar with that. I had GERD something fierce about 25 years ago. <laughs> and so she was just really frustrated and, and upset about it. And I said, okay. Well, let, let, let's, let's look at some things. And I guess it's been, it's been about 14 years now. Chicago has a program called the Windy City Harvest Program where they help people get into urban farming. And in that, in that program, I learned that tomatoes come in all kinds of colors. And I found these little tiny uh grape tomatoes they're called sun gold yeah those oh, are great goodness. those are awesome so i got her some sun gold tomatoes and told her chill chill them and then just eat one or two and see how your body tolerates it and she was just the happiest little camper because her body could tolerate those yellow tomatoes and then we tried some um, size yellow tomatoes and some orange tomatoes and her body could tolerate that so that made her happy. But again, going back to where we started about things being budget friendly, yellow and orange tomatoes in the Midwest are not budget friendly. I'll have to, I haven't been to our farmer's market mostly because it's been nasty and cold, but I'm going to, um, I'll have to look. I haven't had the reduced acid tomatoes in a long time and I probably should switch back to them. Although despite the deer, that almost outpopulate the people where I live. Um, I'm going to do, I've talked to the nursery and I'm gonna do the vertical tomato planting. So you're like hang them. Mm -hmm. Not entirely certain how that works. It was too soon when I talked to them about it. So now we're probably at that point where I need to go back and get all the details. But I should definitely, oh, my husband loved the sun gold. I'm so glad you brought this up because now it's reminding me what I should plant. They are, they are amazing. And so, so eating those things that, that your body can tolerate is really a, an important part of healthy eating because when we feel deprived, it just, it takes all of the, the sensory pleasure out of, out of eating when you just have to eat something boring. Yeah. And that, that brings me to that second point about looking to cultural, different cultural adaptations. Um, my mom, this was just, it was crazy. She, one night she ate her chicken or whatever it was that the night before and the next night she wouldn't eat it. I was like, what in the world? And I noticed she was chewing it in kind of a strange way. And it wasn't, wasn't really chewing, chewing, but it was more like she was trying to suck the moisture out of it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what in the world are you doing? Okay, this is not going to. And then she would spit out the food after she chewed it. And I was like, oh, that's just not attractive. <laughs> so I, just kept, I was watching and I was like, okay, you've got to eat something. Otherwise, you're not going to sleep through the night. And if you don't sleep, I don't sleep. And that's going to be bad all the way around. So I made her eggs. And I was thinking to myself, okay, wait, she can't have eggs for breakfast and then turn around and have eggs for dinner. 
because she needs that protein to keep her sustained through the night. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do with this? And then I remembered I had a cookbook, the giant book of tofu cooking. When I was in my graduate program, one of the things that I did for relaxation was I collected cookbooks. <laughs> and so after a day of all of this heavy stuff that I had to stuff into my brain, hold on to so that I could write about it later, and my brain is on fire, I would just sit down and I would look at my cookbooks. And they were like adult picture books. And so I could read the recipes and I could imagine the flavors coming together and those kinds of things. And so that's how I wound up with this book, The Giant Book of Tofu Cooking. So I went, okay, that can be her evening protein source. And so since I had all these other cookbooks, it's like, okay, no one wants plain tofu. No, 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 no one wants that. <laughs> no. So what can I do? What flavor profiles can I build? And looking at different cultural impact influences to say, okay, what's going to make this taste good? So if I was going to, instead of making chicken paprikash, I could make tofu paprikash. Instead of sag paneer, I could use the spinach and uh, use the tofu instead of the, the cheese and use all those Indian spices. And there's this thing in the foodie world called a mashup where you take food or fruit, food profiles or flavor profiles that, that, that you wouldn't normally find together but can complement each other and you put them together to come up with something really tasty. So I've gotten into that food mashup thing where, you know, you wouldn't have tofu and paprikash, but you can now because she's not going to eat the chicken or the beef in it. I need to learn how to cook more tofu things because the older I get, the less beef I want. So I predominantly eat chicken and vegetarian. Um, mm -hmm. But I absolutely have to have variety so last week in our fridge there was um, a pasta dish that was um, the sauce basically was created from the, the flavor profile of um, spinach artichoke dip i made okay. that mostly for my husband it's a little bit stronger than i would prefer i like it but it's it's a little heavier um chinese uh, chow mein that I made that everybody was raving about. I'm like, I don't know what I did that was so special. It was just basic chow mein. Um, it did have chicken in it. Um, then we have a beef stew because it was cold and yucky and I had to cook up the beef before it went bad. What else? You know, I've got my berries. I've got different breakfast options, but I actually use tofu. This will probably blow your mind. If you take silken tofu, you can replace half the butter in cookie recipes. Oh, Air fry them. That air fry them you will never know and you've reduced the fat you've reduced the crud i mean we all know we don't need too much butter <laughs> as good as it tastes that was one of the uh, tricks that i learned you don't lose 100 pounds with an inherited sweet tooth without learning how to make some serious adaptations <laughs> you'll have to send me that recipe because i would love to try that just take like what I do, I take the traditional Toll House cookie recipe. I also add a quarter cup of dark cocoa powder because I like chocolate on chocolate. And then if you've got it, you can either use a couple of tablespoons, not more than one to two tablespoons of either cold coffee or espresso powder. Okay. I don't like coffee, so don't fret that it's going to make your cookies taste like cafe au lait chocolate cookies. It just punches up the flavor of the chocolate. And yes, then, they're best friends. Coffee yes. and chocolate are best friends. So is port and chocolate, but I don't do port either. So, <laughs> But then just take one stick of butter instead of two. And I'm lazy. It's probably better if you actually weigh it. But just take the stick of butter, put in the equivalent amount of silken tofu. And I've used, okay. I've used firm. It works as well, but the silken works better it doesn't blend in it melts in eventually but it won't you'll all see little chunks of the tofu and you'll be like oh this is going to be gross but nope it all works out just fine trust me <laughs> got yes, some of those because, upstairs <laughs> because tofu will 
tofu is very adaptable. It will take on the flavor of whatever it's sitting next to. Yep. And if you air fry them, then they're like crispy on the outside that you would get with the full butter recipe. Gotcha. Just, I've experimented around. <laughs> I've I've tamed the sweet tooth about as much as possible. Um and then there's less options out there. I used to have, I like frozen yogurt because it's less fat. My body will store, I walk past a nice marbled steak and my body's like, we'll store that there for that famine. I like to make the joke that, you know, if there's a famine, I'm going to win because that is just how my body works. It just stores it. So I have to, I have to watch all of the quantity of fat. It don't matter if it's good fat, bad fat, too much is too much for my body. So your body says, okay, I'm going to hold it. Yup. It hangs on to fat, but the starchy stuff, not so much. I mean, I gotta be careful there too. It can't just be going bonkers. Well, you know, the thing, the thing with starchy things, um, I've been borderline diabetic for over 15 years. And it's like, I've, I'm sorry, I'm going to eat something like that, but I have, but I've learned how to just give my body just enough. And I also, something else that's really important is to listen to your body. What is it telling you? When you have food cravings, your body's telling you it needs something. I always love it when, for whatever reason, this hasn't happened in quite a while because I'm in charge of the f meals. But my husband's terrible about making veggies. Like the tomatoes in the vegetarian chili, that's veggies to him, which isn't totally wrong, but eh, something on the side is important. It is absolutely lovely when your body is like, give me a salad. It's like, well, hello, how about a cookie? No, salad. If I know if my body starts craving salad, I have neglected the vegetable intake. And one of the th other things I do is um, I get two pounds of baby carrots probably every other week. And I have those with my sandwich at lunch. Exactly. And then I have to share them with the golden retriever who also loves carrots. <laughs> you know, I, I have a, I have a good friend and her, she's got this kind of interesting genetic thing that goes on that occasionally will send her into anemia if she's not paying attention to it. Mm. And she says, I know when, I start craving steak, not just, oh, I think I would like some, but really craving it. She's like, oh, iron's low. Got to get this. I had something similar, not the anemia, but the craving for beef when I first started doing strength training. And we drove by a field of cows, and I believe they were dairy cows. I'm not entirely certain, but it was cows. And my little cave woman brain went, oh, cow. Mm. And I was like, oh my goodness, what the heck? Like, That's exactly. a little nuts. And and so again, it's it's feeding your body what it needs in order to perform optimally. I was watching um, a marathon swimmer. I'm a swimmer also. Can't do that. I can't do it. But um, there was a woman, she was swimming somewhere, somewhere Is that the gal that swam from Cuba to Florida? Um, don't remember which one it was, but somewhere was someone was swimming a long distance and every 30 minutes or so she'd like roll over and she looked like a little fish and they were throwing noodles in her mouth. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, if you're going to do that marathon swim, you need, you need those carbs. Yep. And I know for myself on those days when I'm craving um, craving a potato chip, craving potato chips or crackers. It's like, okay, wait, stop. You need protein because right now you're running low. And so you need the carbs to give you that energy to keep going. So pay attention, stop, eat something, eat something proteiny real quick so that you can keep going and you have the energy to continue going. And then that brings me to that last part. Have fun. I mean, you should enjoy, you should enjoy eating. And going back to my, my godmother, 
she was starting to not enjoy food so much because she was missing her tomato. And it was wintertime. So I said, okay, well, let me look around. And, and she loves soups and stews in the winter. And in Chicago, winter lasts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it lasts. So I, she was just a little, little frustrated. So I said, okay, let me do something. And I made some tomato-free white chili, but I used a lot of spices and chi and chilies, not too much to give her heartburn, but just to give just to give it that little punch, and that gave it the redness to trick her brain into thinking that you're eating chili with tomatoes in it. That makes sense. And she just enjoyed that that chili and so that's one of those wintertime things that I do for her is I'll make her a pot of white white turkey chili and going back to those cultural influences you know look look at those different things look at those flavor profiles how can you build something to that's going to be enjoyable regardless of what your restrictions may be I mean, if you, if you can't eat wheat anymore, what can we do? What, what do other cultures that don't eat a lot of wheat, what do they do? And can I build something into my world that's going to be healthy for me, that I'm going to enjoy, and I will continue doing? Yeah. <laughs> because if you don't like doing it, and if it doesn't make you feel good, you're not going to continue. And so healthy eating goes out the window if healthy eating becomes associated with something that doesn't feel good or taste good or you don't enjoy it. I can do it. Yeah, I worked with, um, well, on my weight loss journey, I worked with a female bodybuilder for a while and she was really big on the four ounces of chicken and half a cup of brown rice and some broccoli. And I'm like, and then what? I'm not eating that five, six, seven times a week. Never. <laughs> I don't care. And I've also made the comment, if somebody came to me and said, Jen, I guarantee you that if you ate fish two or three times a week, you would not ever have to worry about Alzheimer's. And if this is your first episode, you have to understand my mom had it for 20 years. My maternal grandmother had it, mixed dementia, including Alzheimer's. And my maternal great-grandmother had some form of dementia. So my history is not great. I don't like fish. I would eat it. If they could guarantee it, I would do it, but I would not like it. I would probably douse it in every t everything I could find to disguise the fishy flavor. I can't stand the smell of fish, nothing. So yeah, you definitely, when I, again, on the weight loss journey, people would say, well, what's your trick? And I'm like, hey, there ain't no trick. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's not easy. Uh -uh. Make changes slowly. Like um, I've been eating a lot more vegetarian because on, so we were talking about GERD. I had that like 25 years ago. And now my previous general physician suggested that I have issues with my throat and my voice because I have what's called silent reflux, which is a very popular diagnosis right now. A friend of mine was just diagnosed with it and she doesn't have any of the throat voice issues that I have. And it's basically, instead of getting heartburn, the acids go into your go, you know, they go backwards and it causes a gas that irritates your vocal cords. I've been doing everything the doctor said for six months. It's still not fixed. I have a new provider actually going to see, well, I'm going to see their nurse practitioner this week and I'm hoping I can get a referral to an ENT so that we can continue on with whatever step three would be. Cause this is super annoying when my voice cracks like a 14 year old boy, <laughs> but the trick is you know, you have to figure out the proper way to feel your body that you're going to do the rest of your life because, you know, it's, you can muscle through a week, a month, maybe even a year, but after that, you're like, oh, I give up. You know, it's just exactly. not fun. And you're not going to, you're not going to enjoy the change. No, that's true. It, it, and, and to be, let's be honest with ourselves. It doesn't matter what it is. If you don't enjoy doing it, you're not going to sustain it. Yep. So I have a trick for people who want to try out different flavor profiles, but they're not sure how to do it. And I have looked like on YouTube 
Um, you used a term earlier. After you have to remind me what it was. Food mashup. I think you said. Yes. Um, because we had this is way back in 2010, 2011. So this was during the the weight loss journey. We went to a restaurant that had a fusion of I think it was Spanish and Filipino, but it was definitely they'd it'd be like pumpkin and something else seasoning and be like that sounds gross and then you taste it and you're like this is nirvana pour this on more of stuff please <laughs> and it was so good and i'm like this is what i want to learn because it's you could take something simple like a piece of chicken or maybe even tofu i should consider that and elevate it to something that just makes your mouth be like and your brain go hoo hoo we've eaten something real good here but if you haven't been able to find that and i'm going to look up food mashup um the easiest way to re- figure out if spices are going to work together open both jars and inhale deeply and if it smells good probably will work if your brain goes yeah that's kind of weird i don't recommend putting that on your food and then you can sprinkle a little bit out and taste it and see if it's you know before you season the entire dish based on your nose i've done that you know it's i'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't remember the percentage, but there was a doctor in Chicago and he was a taste specialist. Hmm. Okay. And he told, and, and like I said, I'm going to say it was around 80%. So, but don't quote me on this, but he said about 80% of what we taste is because of what we smell. I believe that. So think about when you have a really bad cold, nothing tastes good. Unless it's loaded with garlic. <laughs> exactly. You know, you're, you can't taste anything and you're just, you're all stuffed up and you can't taste anything. And you're kind of going like, man, I know I need to eat, but I don't want to. Yeah. It's like, the and, and that's because your nose is out of commission and your nose plays a very, the, the sense of smell is one of those. It, it, I think it's one of those. I think it's the most underrated of our senses. We just, we really pretty much ignore that. And I have a thing about peppers. I love the smell of peppers. If I get a really good, if I'm in a space where there are good fresh peppers, oh, I'm just like in <laughs> hog heaven. <laughs> I may not even need any, but I'm, I'm just like, okay, calm down. Just get enough that you need because you really don't need any peppers. But, you know, and that, that, that sense just takes, it goes back to, like I said, to that cave uh, woman <laughs> thing. Ooh, food, eat it. Yep. Want it. Did you know that, um, what is the, there's, there's a thing of, what is that? Like a biological goes way back to our cave, cave person days. Oh, where poisonous things don't taste sweet. Right. I'm like, oh, is that why I have an inherited sweet tooth? So my maternal grandfather felt very passionately that a meal was not complete until they had dessert. And so they'd have those little Debbie packaged desserts and stuff (laughs) after lunch and after. I don't know what they had after dinner, but all the time. And it's like there's times I've been like, curse jeans. This is terrible. Like and some of it's habit. Like last night I had grapes with my dinner or after my dinner, but I still had that frozen yolk. So it's a Greek yogurt, basically ice cream dessert. Okay. Not, it's not ice cream. It's frozen yogurt. It tastes really good. Lower fat. It, it hits the sweet thing, but I'm telling you, I'm no 90% of that eating that last night was just habit, but you know, you can only fight the genes so hard. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And it gives you pleasure. Yep. You know, there are times when we just need that sweet cream. Mm-hmm. You just need it. And it's when you don't give yourself the grace to have that sweet cream that, and that, that desire is still there. And that's what um, can tip you over into the unhealthy portion of it. Because now you're going to want it. You're going to want to eat more of it. You're feeling deprived, so you've got to have it. 
Whereas, you know, this, when you allow yourself that space to have this enjoyable small bit of ice cream or frozen yogurt, you're, you're okay. But when you tell yourself, no, we can't have that. You just want it more and you're going to eat too much of it once you do get it. I was triggered the other day scrolling on Instagram. Tillamook had an ad for one of their new ice creams. They have four new flavors, one of which was chocolate cookie dough ice cream. And I was like, must have now. <laughs> Where is this? <laughs> and it's like, I really want to try it, but I'm also a little concerned that if it's in my freezer, I will indulge too much. So I'm not, I don't know. My husband's not a huge sweet eater. He thought it sounded delicious, but I guarantee you I would be the one to polish off the half gallon. Exactly. And, and that kind of goes back to what, what I was saying earlier about healthy eating existing in this space of budget friendliness. So the pint of Tillamook is not as budget friendly as the half gallon. And so it incur in the, the uh, sensible part of us that says, no, we want to maintain a good budget says get the get the beer one and the one that's cheaper per ounce exactly exactly but then you have to ask yourself how many hours am i going to spend on the peloton how expensive is it going to be to replace my wardrobe when i eat too much of this good stuff <laughs> those are some of the arguments i actually have not necessarily about the, the clothing but do i really want this because well one you cannot exercise off a bad diet you can go to the gym two, three hours a week or a day, every day for, you know, during the week. But if you eat garbage, you're not going to get the results that you would think you would get from being addicted to the gym. And that, I always thought that was interesting. You cannot burn off a bad diet. Well, when you think about what's in a bad diet, it's usually not very well balanced. You don't have enough protein. If you're going to be in the gym five days a week, two hours a day, I don't know who has that kind of time, but <laughs> not me. <laughs> I mean, there's some people who do. But if you're going to do that to your body, it's got to have good food. It's got to have fuel in it. You've got to have those carbs. You've got to have enough protein to sustain the the your carbs are your sprinters, but your Proteins are your marathon runners. And so those have to be in place in order for you to be able to do this. And if you're stressing your body, and that's a good stress, but you are stressing your body and it doesn't have the, the right fuel in it, it's going to hold on to what it's got. Yep. Because it's like, no, 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 I can't get this up. I'm starving to death. Can't let it go. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not, I don't have what I need to let this go. So yeah. So that whole, whole thing about healthy eating. And I love it when people say a healthy eating lifestyle. What does that mean? <laughs> and again, it's that space of everybody's heard that term. And so it's assumed that we know what it means. But do we really know what that means? I think we're looking for a specific plan or answer. Like, this is what healthy eating looks like. You should have fish and you should have blueberries and you should have those dark red tomatoes and those avocados because those are good fats. And this, that, and the other thing. And we've already discussed why some of us can't eat too many tomatoes. You can't eat avocados because they don't like you. It really comes down to we have to figure out what the proper fuel is for our systems. Like I said, I got friends who look at a loaf of bread and gain weight. I look at steak and, you know, it packs on the fat. So, you know, it's 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 interesting. And I like to do big, long bike rides on the weekend. And I did one a couple of weeks ago. And halfway through, the ladies I was with stopped for a little snacky snack. And, of course, as soon as they stopped and ate a little something my brain went, you know, you didn't eat enough stuff this morning for this kind of activity. And I was like, well, I'm just going to have to suck it up because I haven't had a chance to restock my bike bag with, you know, quick fueling snacks. 
they shared, which was great. But I came home and I ate and I ate probably more than I normally would have, but I did burn a lot of calories. But I was tired the whole rest of the day. I read a book from a upcoming guest. Um, that's pretty much all I did that day. I was like, oh crud, he's on Monday. I better read this book. <laughs> Well, and you know, uh, something else that's interesting uh -huh. um, in this whole eat this, not that world of healthy eating, we have a tendency to look at research and research that isolates a particular nutrient and say, got to have that. I think the, the one that's, that sticks out to me is is turmeric. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, I guess it's been about eight, 10 years now that there was, a, there was some research on Alzheimer's disease. And the authors noticed that in India, the incident of, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease was really low in comparison to um, other Western nations, and they were like, okay, well, wh what is it? And it became, they were like, they eat so much turmeric. So now when you walk in the pharmacy, there's just shelves of turmeric as a supplement. And I, when I saw that, I thought to myself, well, now what about all the other stuff that goes in the curries with the turmeric? What it was, you know, all naturally occurring foods have macro and micronutrients. Well, what about the things that go with the turmeric and their macro and micro uh, 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 nutrients? And how maybe perhaps a lifestyle and a lifetime of eating these small amounts of micronutrients that just really enhances what your body is doing. I was like, no, we can't just take this out of context like that. Why don't we try mm, maybe putting some more Indian spices in our foods that have turmeric in it, which will make it interesting and a lot more fun because who wants this? And, and you, you go by and you look at it and you have, and the milligrams are going up, 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 which means that the pills are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, how much fun is it going to be to swallow five of those giant pills every three times a day in no order thanks. to get that max? It well, in India, they don't eat as much like white starchy carbs like potatoes and pastas. They're more rice, right? And then naan, which is usually a more complex carbohydrate bread. And, and, and then, you know, think about culturally. In, in, in Western cultures, large amounts of meat, whether it's fish, chicken, beef, large amounts of those protein sources are how we into, engage with food. But when you look at other cultures, there may be eight ounces of meat in the dish that's going to serve six people. So it, looking at those cultural and other cultural influences also help you think about, well, how much of this am I eating? Very true. I also really, I've, I've been following um, like off grid, uh, what do they call those people? People that basically live off the grid, grow their own meat and vegetables and all that great stuff. Mm -hmm. And this one particular account on Instagram is called Grow, Build, Raise. He raises his own chickens, ducks, pigs. I think he's going to bring in something else. But he had three pigs. They all had names. And I thought, he doesn't name the critters that end up in the freezer. Although one of them did. And he talks about the pig's name was Whiskey. And he says they made um, pulled pork the other day from Whiskey's pork butt, which of course sounds very strange. And I wonder, because he loves on these animals. I mean, they're treated probably as good as my dog. Hopefully she's not going to take offense. And 
um, you know, they're not stressed out. Whereas we've got cows. I'm not that far from Harris Ranch, which is one of the biggest beef producers in California. You drive by and the stench just punches you in the face. You can love beef and that almost turns you off. And they're crowded in there and they're they're treated like products, uh -huh. not treated like things with souls. Now, I'm not vegan. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Definitely going more vegetarian, but that's just because that's what my body prefers. It's not a moral thing. If I had to kill my own meat, I would probably be totally vegetarian. <laughs> that's just hypocritical. But I'm wondering if the way we're producing our meat and eggs causes the stress hormone in the animals to increase and we're ingesting that and then we live a stressful life and we're increasing our stress hormones we're ingesting stress we're not doing ourselves any favors that's a whole I'm other glad episode you brought that up because um remember when we were children that peanuts and peanut butter were staples mm-hmm and if someone had an allergy, it was to all legumes or all nuts. And so how in a generation did we get to a place where peanuts are almost toxic to this second generation of people? And I, I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, you know, it's not I said it's not the peanuts. It's what, we, it's what we've done to the peanuts and done to the soil in which they're growing. I believe that. I think, you know, there, there might have always been, every food can have some sort of, for lack of a better word, toxic effect on some people. But what is it that we have done that has increased that allergen level to the point where it's it's dangerous to this generation of young people. Yeah, it's almost deadly to some people. Oh, absolutely. You know, and it's like, you know, when you think about someone um, being injured by a peanut, you always thought about them swallowing it whole and it going sideways. Yeah. You can think about um, someone just eating a teaspoon of peanut butter and going into anaphylactic shock. That was not part of our understanding. Yeah, and so pe peanut allergies were pretty rare when I was in school. Exactly. Exactly. And so I was telling, I talked to my friend, I said, no, we have to look at what we've done to our planet. Mm -hmm. And yes, organic foods are, are a great thing. But we have to realize that if you have an organic farmer on the outskirts of conventional farmers, that groundwater is going to still contain some of that. Now, will that um, will organic foods help reduce the amount of chemical fertilizers that are really not so good for us to ingest yet? Yeah, so th that's why they're a good thing. But don't say that this is going to solve the problem because if it's in the soil and if it's in the water, and we don't consistently start saying, hey, we need to take a different approach in how we we're going to grow and what our growing practices are. It's It will help, but it's not going to change anything. That's very true. So this gentleman from the Grow, Build, Raise account. The, so these pigs are grazing pigs, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, and he rotates the pigs and the chickens and the ducks. And you can tell where they've been because the weeds and the grasses that grow where they've grazed and done their business and all that good stuff, dark green. Places that haven't been pale green and when you mm -hmm. rotate them they're the chickens they have a scratch and peck feed so they're scratching and pecking so they're kind of aerating the soil and the pigs they're you know it's like the animal husbandry and the basically the earth maintenance mm -hmm. are healthy ways to grow food 
So he's one of the types that thinks, you know, this whole climate change, we should ban cows is nonsense. And it is when you look at what he's doing. I mean, I think it's a little bit of nonsense, but when you look at Harris Ranch and that nastiness, then you're like, oh, heck yeah, we need to make a change. So my, my wish is that our government would stop subsidizing big agricultural farm conglomerates and and I don't even know if this is physically possible and subsidize the local mom and pop farm that can grow enough eggs to feed their community. Now I live in California, there's an awful lot of us. So I'm not even sure that's physically possible, but that's my wish. I wish we could go back to the old way of growing our food so that it's healthier and probably tastes better. I don't know, I have not had a lovingly raised pig that was then slaughtered in a humane way <laughs> so i have no idea if that tastes better or not well i i going back to those the farm i don't know if you remember this when 30 35 years ago when we were really starting to look at the hole in the ozone and talking about methane <laughs> and i have some friends who are chemists and they were like why are there why are the holes bigger over the industrialized cow farms? Well, what goes in comes out and yep. what's coming out is methane. <laughs> yep. I when, always thought it was the Aquanet that my mom and my sister used. <laughs> like, thankfully nobody in my family smoked, because if you'd lit a, a lighter or a cigarette <laughs> or something between the two bathrooms, the whole house would have gone up in complete <laughs> boom. <laughs> I was in marching band and we had to keep our hair off of the the military high collar. And mm -hmm. so it was like pinned up within an inch of its life and then hairsprayed with it. So I I used hairspray on my wedding day, my sister's wedding day. And that might be about it. Like my hairstylist knows, don't even come near me with that stuff. I don't want that crap anywhere near my hair. <laughs> I, I had I, enough hairspray and band that killed me for the rest of my life. <laughs> exactly. And so we have to think about, you know, when we think about healthy eating, um, we all have to pay attention to what we're doing to our, to our growing medium. Um, the Windy City Harvest Program really put it in my head about, you know, we, we have to think about about our crops, because if we're saying that cabbage has certain nutrients in it, if all you're growing is cabbage, well, you're going to deplete the nutrients in the soil and it's not going to be as healthy coming out, which means you're going to have to put some kind of chemical something in there to replace what you just took out. So it's just really important for us to have healthy soil to create those healthy foods. It's almost a chicken and the egg, which is a really goofy way of <laughs> describing this this conundrum that we find ourselves in with needing more and more food. Although I really think the vertical farming is an interesting, and that's a whole other, probably a whole other episode. Um, but I have one last suggestion before this episode gets too, too long, is that gardening is very mentally healing. And as I said we have deer and we're not we're allowed to fence in 10 percent of so if you've got a 5,000 square foot lot you can fence 500 of it well the yard was already here when we moved in so i i have ideas of what i'd like to do but probably never going to happen so i have deer which means i my options for gardening are either to build a completely raised garden jail that's six feet tall that the deer can't get into. Or I have some pots on the stairs on my deck, like on the three stairs that get the most sunshine. And I've got mint in one and basil in the other two. And I said I was going to do vertical gardening of the tomatoes. We can improve what we eat just with little bits of little bits of effort on our own part, you know, like fresh basil. We all know that tastes great. I cannot tell you how many times I have ordered basil and it's not come because they're out of stock, which is super annoying. This is not 2020. I expect my groceries to be in stock at all times, <laughs> my little privileged self says. Um, so it's, you know, 
you can do a lot in in not a lot of space you can put uh -huh. a lot of herbs in pots I've seen um, battery operated grow lights, which I know that gives people uh -huh. the wrong ideas that you can put like my, I have a, a garden kitchen window, but it yeah. faces south and it gets, it gets good sunlight, but not for plants. <clears throat> Discovered that the first year we lived here. So I may, I may or may not get the grow lights to use with herbs, but it, right now I'm focusing on how many more pots can I put on the deck before it looks like the nursery exploded. <laughs> my poor deck <laughs> you know and because i can't put them in the grass area because the deer will eat them. <laughs> exactly and um what is that show oh homestead rescue i'll have, have to check that out that? no i'll have to check that out it's, it's interesting because you have these people who were homesteaders going around helping people who are struggling to homestead and just some really cool, interesting things that you can do and about gardening, about gardening and about um, building um, greenhouses and things like that, that don't, and because these are homesteaders, they don't have a lot of money. So they recycle a lot of pieces and, and do that. So it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, I did. I started seeds for my, my old home which was in a farming community. I had four, three feet by 16 foot garden boxes. And one year I started um, a bunch of seeds on just an old wire shelving unit. So like the four or five shelves that I then, I, I wrapped them in plastic. I don't know if it was a plastic drop cloth. Um, and at one point my landscaper, the gardener said, you need to open this because it's getting too hot in there. And I'm like, it's not even warm out. How do you, and he's like, see all the, the moisture, all the condensation He's like, you need to open this up. And, you know, that was, it was a cheap shelf and cheap plastic. And I think I used like egg cartons and little Dixie cups. Yeah. So you don't have to get crazy. No, no. no. Um, when I was in that gardening program and we were um, seeding, because we had clients and what would happen is we'd, we'd start the plants indoors for them. And then they would, we would take them over to the client and we used leftover bread trays. We'd make our soil blocks and then put them in the um, seed trays. I mean, uh, pardon me, in the in leftover bread trays. Lots of options. Exactly. So, and just one last thing, plants are, plants are good. For humans yep they're good for humans so it's it's and herbs for people who say i kill plants if you kill plants try herbs they're pretty hardy <laughs> that's true yeah they're pretty hardy they may wilt over a little bit if they need some more water but um overall they're pretty hardy and mint is one of those things that um you really have to be something special if you can kill it. The only time I killed a mint plant is it got overwatered and literally, I think there was like an inch and a half of water on top. Uh, so yeah, exactly. I poured the whole thing out and then some of the, I mean, the soil was just soggy is an under, <laughs> is not even describing how bad it was. So I don't, something happened with the drip system and it went bonkers and it basically drowned the plant. And I didn't, bring in the the mint and the two basil plants that I had on the deck from last year into the house early enough. And so they didn't obviously survive the winter, but this year I will bring them in before it gets too terribly cold because I miss my basil mayonnaise. It's the best, you basically combine fresh basil and mayonnaise and salt and pepper, a little squirt of lemon, best thing on sandwiches. Like I'm not a mayonnaise person, but I loved that. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching my, my basil plants grow. I'm like, come on, mama needs some more basil. <laughs> See, the growing season in Chicago is so short. So I, I do love my basil. But one thing that will tolerate a little bit of cool and go into the fall are sage and thyme. They're a little bit more tolerant. And you ultimately have to harvest it, but... Um, 
they, they'll tolerate they'll tolerate it and they'll tolerate being indoors um pretty okay so well so we've gone concerned. from from eating healthy eating diversely to planting some of our own stuff to well that's part of that's yeah. part of diverse eating mm -hmm. you know those little pots little pops of of fresh herb helps helps change the flavor profile and then not to mention that it smells good and so like sometimes in the as the winter's heading towards me and i'll just go in and i'll just rub the thyme and it smells good i don't know if there's some biochemical thing that goes on with it but it just makes me happy to smell my thyme <laughs> there probably is so i hope we've given people some ideas on how to eat healthy for your body, how to add some healthy ingredients to your, to your daily intake without breaking the budget. This has been fun. I'm glad I ate lunch before this because now my brain is really seriously <laughs> thinking about food. <laughs> I'll have to ignore that for the next few minutes. I'll, I'll go do some other work and then my brain will be like, hey, it's dinner time. I'm like, okay, yeah, you can have some more food now. <laughs> Well, I'm glad and I hope that my comments and discussion are things that will give people a real balanced and realistic understanding of what healthy eating is. Make it good for you, try those cultural influences, and just have fun. Totally agree. I appreciate this. And I've got Sherry's uh, website linked in the show notes so you guys can check out what uh, the other things that she does. And if you guys are hungry, go find something healthy to eat. Well, thank you for having me again. It was my pleasure. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.